what's a nutrient and how do we talk about nutrition? Are we thinking about you know survival or are we thinking about the quality of life and health? If we focus on the macronutrients, the things that you'll find on nutrition labels, for example, you know, carbs, proteins, fats, a few of the major elements that our bodies need. You know, the story is pretty muddy in terms of organic versus conventional, frankly. But those are things we need to live not to thrive. The things that we need to thrive are micronutrients and phytochemicals, things that help our bodies run well, things that promote our health. David Montgomery is a professor at the University of Washington, a MacArthur Fellow, and an internationally recognized authority on geomorphology. I think I got that right. He lives with his wife, Anne Bickley, who is also with us on the show today. Anne's a biologist and environmental planner whose writing has appeared in Nautilus, Natural History, Smithsonian, and more. And today, David and Anne are here together to talk about the amazing new book they co-authored titled, What Your Food Ate, How to Heal Our Land and Reclaim Our Health. Amen. David and Anne, welcome. Thank you, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, likewise. So it's great to have you. I love your book. Um, so it, it sounds like, you know, in reading the book, it sounds like in order to save the planet, we don't have to eat lab-grown fake meat. <laughs> we'll start there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the key things that we're really trying to get across in the book is that the big element of the conversation around, you know, what to eat both for our own health and for the health of the world around us, literally the health of the planet, is that we should really be asking about how our food was raised as much as we're asking ourselves about what it is that we eat. And, you know, as we go into in the book, those are just ways to raise livestock that are you know better for the planet than we're doing now conventionally, and that also turn out to be better for us. So, you know, the big argument I think we would make is that whatever one chooses to eat, We need to think about more responsibly raising and growing it in ways that benefit the health of the land, the health of the soil, literally, because that ripples up to influence our health in a positive way when we when we raise stuff in a better manner. And I'll say amen to that. (laughs) (laughs) So 100 percent agreed. And so if if we rewind just to set the stage a bit, I I know there's a there's a long and rich history of, of things we've done wrong in terms of how we farm over the the past century or so um what are some of the things that really stick out to you because there's a lot of of what we did wrong and then part two of that question how do we get it right Mm I, I think, you know, at the at the highest level, I think, in terms of what, what sort of went wrong with 20th century agriculture was that we prioritized thinking about physics and chemistry over biology. And agriculture is an inherently biological process. And yet the way we looked at the soil, um, the sort of the foundation for farming was as a foundation for holding plants up while we did things to the soil that would improve the physics of the moving water through it. And we added chemicals to, that we would thought would, were, were needed. And we kind of lost track of the importance of the ecology of the soil, the soil biology. And that's sort of where Anne and my areas of interest and training overlap. She's a biologist. I'm a geologist. Thinking about soil as a combination, as an ecosystem that would respond to how we treat the land was something that just wasn't front and center in terms of 20th century agricultural thinking. And the more we've learned in the 20th century, the more we've realized how we went down some some paths that had uh, unintendedly uh, bad consequences for the land and, and and we think for our health as we lay out in the book. Yeah, and I, I think maybe just to follow up a little bit on that, um, it, it's to say that really what's going on, like the, it has not always been well understood that the organisms that live in the soil. And so I mean a vast array of things from things you can see like an earthworm down to tiny things like bacteria, virus, viruses, even fungi. And so all of these soil organisms play a big role in both moving nutrients out of the soil and into a plant, a crop, And they also play a role through something else that's, you know, a a much sort of newer, uh, even kind of a strange idea in some ways. And that is that these microorganisms, when they consume 
you know, what they eat, which in large part is, is organic matter, they're producing byproducts. And so there's these metabolites that they produce that a plant also takes up. And so this isn't something that a hundred years, you know, you're going to go buy a bag of microbial metabolites and put it in the soil. And so this is, um, this is one of the big things that we missed because as Dave mentioned, we had, we had chemists and physicists who were, you know, conducting a lot of research in soil science. It wasn't so much biologists. Biology is harder to see. It's more dynamic. And especially in the soil, it's constantly changing. So in order to dimensionalize the, the size of the problem or, or opportunity, if you will, what percentage of farmland in the U.S. would you say is problematic in terms of we've done damage to it versus percentage of farmland where we're practicing regenerative agriculture or have an organic farming pro organic farming practice or just we haven't done damage to it like how do you think about like where we are looking at the whole pie well the i think the direct answer to that question is damn near all of it's been degraded um there's a, a percent that's less than 10 percent that you could roll in uh organic farms and regenerative farms into and it's it's less than 10 percent nationally the way i like to look at it is in terms of how much of the organic matter uh has been has been lost how much topsoil has been eroded and how much organic matter has been lost from our farmland soils and the statistic on say the, the state of iowa for example one of my ex-graduate students put out a paper a couple of years ago looking at quantifying the magnitude of soil loss from um, across the corn belt in the u.s and it's roughly 50 percent over the last couple centuries the historical record you know of post-european colonization uh, and that 50% number is also roughly about the magnitude of the degradation of soil organic matter averaged across farmlands in the U.S. And indeed, that number is pretty comparable for the world as well. So we, we've degraded an awful lot of our farmland, not to the point where it's out of production, but to the point where it's not growing, able to grow as much food as it used to be. And the UN's 2015 Global State of the Soil report uh, concluded that we're losing about a third of a percent of our ability to feed ourselves globally each and every year to ongoing soil loss and soil degradation. And we've already degraded about a quarter to a third of the world's farmland pretty seriously. And those numbers, if you play that out to the end of this century, that starts to add up to an awful lot of our ability to feed people on this planet being degraded because of the way we've treated the land. Well, you lead me to my next question because the knock on organic or regenerative agriculture and in some regards the, the case for for gmos from some is that hey you can't feed the planet and so my question to you is i think i know the answer but see we, can we really nurture our soil and feed everyone yeah that's that's a myth that's been out there for a long time and i when i hear that Something that comes to my mind is this. We waste an awful lot of food, at least in the United States. The statistics are somewhere around 30%, sometimes as high as 40% of our food is getting tossed. And so, you know, think about that in the context of your question and at the same time, you know, that we're throwing away all that food, we're throwing away the things that we use to grow it, fertilizer, water, and so on. And I'm sure Dave has something to say about this too. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of studies that have, have sort of concluded that there is something of a yield gap between organic and conventional agriculture. But, uh, you know, on the, and the ranges of that range from a few percent up to 20%, depending on the study and the comparisons. But when you dig into it and you burrow into, well, what were the studies they were sweeping together to make these broad comparisons? And you look at um, uh, the some of them that have looked at um, the different practices that are involved, because there's a wide range of practices in both the organic and conventional world. And if you grow um, organic crops that were, or crops that were bred for performance, for yield in organic systems in healthy, fertile soil, they are comparable yielding to crops that are bred for performance in nitrogen rich environments and conventional fields. In other words, if you don't take the state of the soil, how healthy the land is into account in those comparisons, you can, it can seem like the yield gap is much bigger. So one of the questions that, that I think we really should be asking ourselves globally is whether that's true in terms of feeding the world and why not 
improve the health of our soil so that yields can be improved in organic systems to the point where they are um, more broadly comparable to uh, what we have conventionally today. And some of the farmers that we interviewed, uh, both in uh, What Your Food Ate, the new book, and Growing a Revolution, the previous book, uh, was, those regenerative farmers, once they had restored fertility to their land, their yields were comparable to, if not higher than, those of their conventional neighbors. Uh, and so I think that the, the big question that needs to be asked, you know, whenever I hear that, oh, organic can't feed the world, the question I ask is, well, it depends on how we treat the land. And so we have a choice going forward about what kind of methods we'll be depending on. And there's a whole other host of benefits from organic practices and regenerative practices. And I think that is, it is very feasible to think about rebuilding the health and fertility of the world's farmlands to the point where we can have comparable yields to what we're getting today with conventional practices. You know, and I think it ladders up to this larger point that you make in the book that healthy soil leads to uh, healthy individuals. And, you know, I mentioned before the show to you guys, every once in a while, I'll see something in mainstream media calling into question if organic is truly better than conventional, you know, maybe we're just all wasting our money and that always gets so annoyed by it for, for various reasons. And in the book, you go into great detail and cite numerous studies to kind of put this argument to, to rest. You know, I'll start with one. It was a 1993 study published in the Journal of Applied Nutrition that reported the significant differences in the mineral content of conventional organic foods purchased from grocery stores in Chicago over a two-year period. Organically grown wheat, potatoes, apples, and pears averaged 60 to 125 percent more iron, zinc, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and potassium than their conventional grown counterparts. Then you also, you know, go on to talk about some other studies. And it, one I thought was so interesting, a 2001 review of 41 studies reported that organic crops on average had 20 to 30 percent more vitamin C, iron and magnesium. You cite another study in 2014 in the British Journal of Nutrition, which essentially said that organically grown foods have significantly higher levels of phytochemicals. You can go on and on. People should go get the book. There's so much in there. So once and for all, can we just like address this and talk about the health benefits of organic versus conventional? Because to me, it's just so clear. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. And all of what you just um, um, put out there, Jason, it's also really good to remember how variable um how variable things are, both uh, the condition of the soil, the kind of crop farmers growing, um, and so on. And when it comes to organic, you know, all, what all of these studies are basically revealing is that farming practices are affecting the life of the soil. And when soil life is least disrupted, sort of the, the transportation functions and the acquisition functions and all of these things that, that soil life does, it puts these nutrients right at the doorstep of a plant, which is to say right at their root system. And so it, this is why, <laughs> this is why those studies are showing those findings, especially for things like the, um, the micronutrients, the vitamins and the uh, or excuse me, the, the minerals, well, and also vitamins. But what's also interesting is that we, in the book, we sort of consider there's, there's four things that farming practices really affect. You can think of them like the fab four, okay? And it's the phytochemicals, the micronutrients, the fats, and the microbial metabolites. And with regard to crops, at least, what we know about phytochemicals, and it's not surprising that they're higher in organic, is that when crops are thoroughly you know communicating and there's high functionality between crops and their soil microbiome phytochemical levels are high people used to think oh it's just you know it's the stressors it's environmental stressors that produce uh, phytochemicals in a plant and that is true that's not untrue or anything like that but um it takes more than just, you know, pest pressure and exposure to UV light for crops to, to start manufacturing phytochemicals. It's, you sort of think about it, it's the whole, you know, way in which a plant sort of 
um, lives in its world. And phytochemicals are this sort of hybrid, um, you know, arsenal, uh, pharmacy, and communication system. And so you want a plant to be living how plants are supposed to live because that imbues them with high levels of phytochemicals. And for that, you want soil health. So when, when we were reviewing, we, you know, it's trying to look into the, the subject that you were just asking about. We tried to look at every paper we could find that had compared organic versus conventional, uh, the nutri nutritional content of organic versus conventional. And, you know, it is a confusing literature. There's lots of studies done in different ways, focusing on different things. But our takeaway in reviewing all that was that there's some consistencies in that in, it's, you know, in almost all the studies, there's less pesticides in organic uh, produce. That's not a terribly big surprise, right? <laughs> um, there were also um, uh, more heavy metals in conventional uh, produce. Um, the in terms of more of uh, the nutritional aspects of things uh, it was there's a lot of back and forth has focused on what we might call macronutrients the sort of the the things our bodies need lots of and a lot of the the, the media reports you see about people saying oh it, organic's better oh it's not better they focus on the macronutrients which are actually quite variable depending on the geology of the farm how thing, um and so forth what really seemed to be fairly consistent was that organic produce and regeneratively raised produce had higher levels of phytochemicals that Dan was just talking about and higher levels of mineral micronutrients. And the reasons that, that you might suspect that re relate back to both crop breeding uh, and also to um, the effect of conventional farming practices on the life in the soil to, to the detriment of life in the soil and the beneficial aspects of organic farming practices to life in the soil. And the big difference there is that, you know, if we focus on the macronutrients, the things that you'll find on nutrition labels, for example, you know, carbs, proteins, fats, a few of the major elements that our bodies need, um, you know, the story is pretty muddy in terms of organic versus conventional, frankly. But those are things we need to live, not to thrive. The things that we need to thrive are micronutrients and phytochemicals, things that help our bodies run well, things that promote our health. And that's where it seems that the clear differences lie. So a big part of, I think, the argument that's been confusing on this topic is what's a nutrient and how do we talk about nutrition? Are we thinking about you know, survival or are we thinking about the quality of life and health? It's, it's an excellent point. And uh, it's obviously clear to me we need to think about nutrition <laughs> and vitamins, minerals, and nutrients so we can set ourselves up to thrive because we're clearly not thriving. Many of us aren't thriving in this country. And so... With all that said, you know, you mentioned fats and, you know, I started the podcast by joking. So it looks like lab grown meat isn't going to be the solution. And, and so let's segue to, to fats and ancel keys and animal fats and provide us with some history to, to give us a little bit of a frame of how you think about fats, animal fats and the role they play in this ecosystem. Yeah. So, you know, it, ancel keys was a, uh, interesting um, kind of a scientist. He, uh, his background was like in exercise physiology and he had done research on um, basically sort of starvation scenarios. This, and, and people might think why and how, why is this happening? In part because um, this research was in sort of the run up to and through World War II and um, people in Europe were not getting enough to eat. And the United States government and other governments were trying to figure out, like, what is the minimal calorie requirement so a person doesn't um, perish? So that's An Ansel Keys was kind of where he started out. And then, you know, naturally, when you start, you're thinking about what do people need, you know, to live and thrive and so on, he got deeper and deeper into diet. And we talk in the book, he was really, I don't know, maybe he's a little bit mismaligned and or maligned in some ways in that he was doing science at a time where we he obviously didn't have the advantage of all of the um analytical techniques that you know labs have today and so the one thing he really looked at ended up looking at um was a fat was cholesterol and he's known for something called the seven countries study and in it he um gathered these you know huge data sets looking at health outcomes and he ended up linking, he and you know, people he was working with ended up linking um, high 
dietary levels of cholesterol to premature death. Now, a couple of problems with this studies, they were um, mostly focused, uh, well, I think they were entirely focused on middle-aged uh, men. So that's not everybody um, you know, who's living at that time or who is living now, of course. And the other thing was that cholesterol, when you get into the biochemistry of fats, there are hundreds of different kinds of fats, some of which our body can synthesize from other things in our diet. Um, other kinds of fats, we don't have, you know, we don't have the machinery to, you know, gin them up, so to speak. And so what Keyes didn't look at was two uh, families of fats, it, very closely anyway, let's just put it that way. And these are the omega, so-called omega-6 fats and the omega-3 fats. And so these two kinds of fats, they are... Um, and cholesterol is considered a saturated fat. And as soon as Keyes began, you know, publishing this research, he even made it onto the cover of Time magazine as, you know, man of the year, person of the year for this research. And it 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 set a trajectory in medicine and in the food industry that uh, vilified fats all across the board, across the board. And we are still trying to get out of that. And Keyes was conducting this research, you know, back in the 1940s and 50s, and we cannot seem to get out from under that. And so with omega-6 and omega-3 fats, what we now know is that cholesterol has some linkages to health outcomes, but the ratio, the balance of omega-3 and omega-6 fats is at least... Uh, as influential, if not more so. And the omega-3 and 6 fats, they even have an interesting name. They're considered essential fats. And that word essential has to do with the fact that um, we cannot live without them. So this whole notion that we should get fats out of our diet doesn't really comport with science. We need both of these kinds of fats. And I don't want to you know, vilify one over the other, but basically where we're at now with, with respect to these two kinds of fats is that we, omega-3s have kind of been shoved out of the human diet and omega-6 fats have um, really kind of overtaken them. And this has to do with how we raise uh, the animals that become food in the human diet. And it also has to do with how we process some plant foods. And I, I can go into that more, but, but was that kind of what? Yeah, I think, I think it's such an important point. You know, omega-3 is highly essential, linked to heart health, brain health. You, you, we want to diet rich in omega-3s, omega-6s, inflammatory. I think where you're going is a lot of processed, industrialized seed oils, fried food, vegetable oils, canola oils, you know, not good for you. You want a healthy three to six ratio. You don't want a ratio where it's a high six to three. You want a high three to six so omega three to omega six ratio. You need six, but you don't want, you know, three to one, six to three. You want three to one. And I'm making the numbers up. I'm not a doctor. Three to six. And so with that said, I think it's an important point because I do want to segue to animals and fats. There's a huge difference between, you know, if we're going to talk about cattle and, and red meat specifically, huge difference between eating grass-fed, grass-finished beef versus corn-fed, soy-fed, who knows whatever, fed beef in terms of vitamins, minerals, key nutrients, specifically omega-3 and omega-6. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, plants and animals have always um, reflected the environments in which they're grown or raised. And that is really, really true for our animals, in particular herbivores. These are the ruminants. So this is not only cows, but it's also sheep and goats as well. And the fats in their body reflect the fat, what we call the fat of the land. And so you get a really favorable fat profile when a cow is out there grazing on living plants. And there's some just basic biology behind that, which is this. Living plants are photosynthesizing and omega-3s 
are fundamental to photosynthesis. So it's a very quick acting kind of a fat. It, can, it helps the plant capture this light energy and turn it into you know, energy that's growing the plant. So a, a, a cow that is out there grazing, whether beef cattle or a dairy herd, their diet is really rich in omega-3s because omega-3s are in leafy living kinds of plants. And um, so you then pull, you know, uh, a cow off of its outdoor lifestyle, off of its omega-3 rich diet, you put it in a feedlot. And as you'd mentioned, you feed them a diet that's really rich in omega-6 fats. And this is, you know, this is seed oils. A seed is a really different kind of a plant part than a leaf. A seed is a, it's not photosynthesizing, right? It's it's not a dead part of the plant, but it it doesn't, it doesn't, fill itself up with omega-3s the way a leaf does. So this is, I always think of, of our ruminants, our land mammals, they're, they're kind of the, the whales and the seals of land in that they are consuming these omega-3 rich diets if we let them, that is. And that's what they evolved to do because all these omega-3 fats in these animals are really benefiting their health. And so it's this, it's this sort of co-evolution that's been going on for a long, long time between a really specialized kind of herbivore and all the plant communities out there. So there's a study that we mention, we go into um, in the book, and uh, some researchers modeled diets that looked at how do we get people, how do we get more omega-3s into the human diet? And it, it turns out, you know, you don't need to eat, you know, a hamburger, <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. But you do need to, if you're going to be eating meat and dairy products, switch over to grass-fed because of the levels of omega-3 in, in animals raised that way. And at the same time, kick the stuff out of your diet that is really rich in omega-6 fats. And so that is nearly every single kind of processed or ultra processed food because there's a lot there's a lot of these seed oils the omega-6 ones that go into that so in other words you bring up your omega-3s you pull down your omega-6s and you get that ratio closer to what you were talking about you know ideally you know you want about an even balance if you can get there if not you know maybe you know try to keep it to you know two or three to one omega-6 to or excuse me, omega, omega six to omega three. That way, you know your body is getting um, enough of these omega threes. And we can go into later, like, okay, so what are these omega threes actually doing in our body that everybody's harping on us to be eating more? Because that turns out to be pretty interesting too. Let's go there. Oh, okay, yeah. And um, so we don't often think about. We think about fats, uh, if we think about them at all, as kind of, you know, the stuff around our middles and stuck onto our behinds. But fats biochemically do an innumerable number of things in our body. And one of the things that sort of come to the fore more recently with fats is that they play a really foundational role in, of all things, um, our immune system, something I think we're all way more interested in these days than we were. Uh, you know, before the pandemic. And our immune system is, um, it's kind of touchy, it's very precise, and it's very fast acting. And there's a great reason for that. A virus comes in, you want your immune system on that virus right away. And this is where omega-6 fats come into play. Um, immune cells get a hold of those fats, which are stored in cell membranes, and they start churning out all of these compounds that basically orchestrate the beginning of uh, inflammation and the beginning of the process that kills off viruses, cancer cells, all this abnormal bad stuff you don't want happening in your body. But <laughs> omega-6 fats, um, they when our immune system gets a hold of them, it's sort of like, okay, we're done with that. The virus is gone. The abnormal cell is gone. We don't need to be remodeling the body anymore. We don't need to be burning up tissue. We don't need to be, you know, doing this sort of demolition process because that is really damaging. And so that's where omega-3 fats come into play. 
They're the ones, our immune cells get a hold of them. They start churning out compounds and molecules that start dialing this whole process back. Back to where? Back to normal, back to balance. And for a long time, immunologists thought, oh, inflammation, that's just sort of this process. It starts and then it just kind of sputters out. Nobody ever thought that it took as much to turn it off as it did to turn it on. And so it begins to make sense then when you look at the um, autoimmune and inflammatory based disorders that are happening with so many of us today, they begin to make sense their increased um, incidence and, and prevalence across the population because our diets, the human diet has become so saturated with omega-6 fats. So here inflammation starts and our immune cells go to grab some omega-3s to get this thing, you know, halted, we need to put a stop to this, and there aren't any. So you get low-level inflammation sort of just going on and on and on. And so I, what I love it, I think you clearly illustrate the point that we do need animals. We do need grass-fed beef. They do play a significant role in the ecosystem, but also in our own health and well-being. And I think, you know, it, it's always helpful to frame regenerative agriculture, organic farming, you know, beyond, hey, this is the right thing to do to actually there's some real nutritional benefit that a health conscious person or someone who's not health conscious, like we could all benefit from. And I think you do such a good job. I think that's one example. Can you talk about you, you, so, so many great examples in the book where you go, go through different foods one i also thought was 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 interesting tomatoes talk about tomatoes and flavonoids tomatoes are you know they're they're just, they're kind of such an iconic food you know they come in italian cuisine and dishes we're talking with you now in august and seattleites where we live are just we cannot wait for the tomatoes to come on. It's been a very, very late season. And I know a lot of the country is maybe sick of tomatoes. Well, our tomatoes are just getting here. And and whenever I start eating tomatoes, I think about this research that um, you've asked about. And so there were researchers, and I, I can't recall if it was at University of Florida or maybe Florida State, but they, they gathered people together because they're trying to figure out what's the best tasting tomato and how do we determine that? What is making that happen? They gathered people together. They uh, fed them two different kind of tomatoes. One was some, a one called the Flora Dade. This was a cultivar created back in the '70s, and you know the way then and maybe okay today even <laughs> we bred tomatoes was for shipping and for convenience. We weren't really breeding them for flavor. And they compared that tomato in people's taste preferences to this other one that was a um, a small cherry type tomato that was used in a lot of breeding, but it was much closer to um, wild tomato. And everybody, people rejected the Floridade and they liked the other one. And these researchers then took this other tomato. It has a, a, a kind of not a great name. I think it's, it's LA1673 or something like that. It's like a probiotic strain. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so not a great name for it, but what this little tomato had in it that was so interesting that linked to the flavor profile and to people's taste preferences was um, three things that we mentioned before. That was phytochemicals and fats, it, um, actually phytochemicals, fats, and then amino acids. So the profile of this preferred tomato, in particular with phytochemicals and fats, there was um, an abundance of those things. And they were linked to why people liked that tomato. So in other words, the things that our body is hankering for and that we sort of know how to eat on an unconscious level are actually the things that are the most nutrient dense as well. So this fluoridate, in other words, um, was not so dense in phytochemicals, was not so dense. And these fats, I have to mention, Jason, they were omega-3 fats, not these other types of fats. So here we have this tomato and it's like, wow, this is terrific. Flavor equals nutrition and our bodies have wisdom 
and we hanker for that kind of a tomato if we can get it. But in order for us to get it, farmers need to grow it. So, and and if you think about that evolutionarily, it makes it makes a lot of sense for people you know, over the last few million years as we evolved into what we are today to be sort of hardwired to know what to eat, just like an herbivore can kind of figure out what to eat all on their own without us having to figure it out for them. Um, but when we get to the point, when we got to the point of um, uh, sort of industrialized food processing in the in the re- in our recent history, that link between sort of flavor and the health of of fresh whole foods got broken, and we can kind of convince ourselves that things taste absolutely delicious, even if they're not very good for us. You, know, you mentioned taste; that was so interesting. You talk about super tasters. Can can we spend a moment on super tasters? Sure. Sure. Sadly, I don't think I am one. <laughs> I think I can vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. So, what what we know about, um, in part, about the you know human sort of the human body and taste and how we perceive it is there's various things that we're probably people have heard of. You know, when it comes to taste, there's there's sweet and there's um, acid and there's umami and there's bitter and I think I'm forgetting one but I want to focus on this sour. bitter they just include me in sour sour is different than bitter though and where the bitter tastes hail from in the human diet are our plant foods phytochemicals are related to bitter tastes and what a bitter taster is is somebody who, this just happens to be their genome. They have, um, you know, that they got from their mom and their dad. They happen to be, um, so how, let me back up. How does our body know what these tastes are? We have different receptors, not just in the nose and the oral cavity, but in fact, all over our bodies. So there are specific receptors for these bitter substances. And super tasters, have, um, it's probably a combination. They probably have more receptors and they probably have, or, and, or they have receptors that are more sensitive to these bitter substances. And so they are highly attuned to these bitter types of foods. So what does that mean? You know, um, when you're sitting down to dinner with a bitter taster, what, and Dave, Dave will put some bitter thing out there, um, say it's uh, something like a. Of course, we have we'll have to use kale or broccoli or something like that. And Dave will eat a pile of this thing and go yum, or at least I hope he will. The super taster will have one bite of that, and let's presume all of this stuff is grown in healthy soil and the sulforaphane. That's that's something that's going to imbue this kale or broccoli with bitters. That super taster is going to sit down and eat. Go ugh, black or not black, but I think I can only handle about like, you know, five forkfuls of this stuff and I'm done because it's way too bitter for me. And, um, and so this is just sort of the difference and the variability of, um, you know, of human being. And so there's about a quarter of the population that's a super taster. There's about a quarter of the population, which is, they're called a non-taster. That's a bit of a misnomer. And then the rest of us are kind of all there in between. We're neither super sensitive nor not tasting much of these bitters. And um, what's even more interesting about, we have receptors for all of these different kinds of tastes, but when it comes to the bitter substances, we have, I think there's something like around 23, 24 different kinds of receptors for bitters, whereas comparison to say a sweet taste, we've got like two or three. Umami, there's maybe half a dozen different kinds of receptors. So what this tells us is, yeah, plant foods and the phytochemicals and other things in them have always been sort of a uh, a compass of sorts for our body wisdom. It's something that our biology um, is hugely interested in. I'll, I'll just put it that way. And people used to say, oh, that's because plants can be poisonous. And that's it's only part of it. We're not just, you know, the body's not just out there surveilling for poisons. It's out there surveilling for nutrients. You'd mentioned flavanols, right? Flavanols are rich in, um, you know, some of our best tasting tomatoes. You know, building off of that, 
you have a story around the amino acid. I'm going to butcher the name, but it's Ergo for short. Can you, can you talk about Ergo? <laughs> yeah, Ergo is, is short for ergothionine, which is an amino acid that um, uh, it turns out is actually made by fungi in the soil. So it and it turns out also to have properties that have led some researchers to classify it as a longevity vitamin, something that it actually helps maintain our bodies over the long run. And it's something that has a very direct connection between the health of the soil and the health of people because of that. Because fungi in the soil are organisms that are very sensitively affected by how we treat our farmland. If you think about the combination of tillage and uh, excessive use of nitrogen, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers that characterizes conventional agriculture today, those are both things that there's solid scientific literature that, that demonstrates disrupts and interferes with fungi in the soil. Uh, and, and a plow is, is not too hard to imagine if you have uh, fungi that has um, their fungal hyphae, their root-like equivalents. Uh, they get chopped up by the by a plow, and nitrogen fertilizers affect the the relationship between uh, crops and the fungi that they recruit as partners in the soil. Um, but the point being that if we have this this um, microbially this fungally produced compound in the soil that gets taken up by crops and into our food that seems to have um, beneficial medic medicinal effects for us. If we disrupt the production of it in the soil, and that's the only source, then we're not getting as much of it in our food. Um, so, you know, one of the key things in terms of looking at um, soil life and its relationship to our own health is we're still trying to figure out who all the key players are in soil life and what they do and how it all works. There's a long uh, evolutionary history of relationships that we have inadvertently disrupted in in very recent times that filters up into our food supply. And ergothionine is one of the, one example of one where by uh, disrupting its production in the soil, we may, we have interrupted its supply into our food. And what's that doing to our health? There's some very interesting studies that suggest that we've sort of inadvertently um, uh, decreased the level of a compound that's actually really good for us in term over the long run, in terms of maintaining our bodies throughout life and particularly as we age. So if I zoom back out, you know, less than 10% of our farmland is regenerative or practicing organic. And it's so clear to me, to you, to our listeners, that this is something we should focus on. Better soil is better for the planet and it produces better, more nutritious food, which we, we all need. We've got a huge health problem here in this country. And then I say, well, how, how are we going to do this? If, if essentially our government subsidizes corn, we're not subsidizing the right things. Like, it seems to me like we need systemic change at the highest level to really make a difference. Or am I just, and I'm an optimist, but I, I always, I have the conversations like the one I'm having today. It's like, it's so clear, but... Is government really, are we really going to do anything here? Well, you know, I think we kind of need basically uh, progress on three different tracks. Uh, one is in terms of uh, agricultural policies, the whole the sort of governmental angle on things. And, and frankly, you're right. We have our subsidies on backwards. We're, we're subsidizing conventional practices that have degraded the land in the past and that will continue to degrade it into the future if we maintain them. And if you think about, you know, public policy over the long term, it would make a lot more sense to, to help uh, foster, and subsidize, and support practices that rebuild the health of our agricultural land, rebuild soil health. It's also one of the biggest levers I think that we have in terms of public health. If we could change our diet so that it was more supportive of health in terms of uh, um, limiting the onset and progression of chronic diseases, that, that's what's absorbing our public health budget you know, at present anyway. So if we can start looking at agricultural policy as health policy at a national scale and at a global scale, it would help. But there's also two other sort of areas that I think that could be very useful in uh, furthering a transition from conventional to a more regenerative style of agriculture. Um, and that is uh, the one that has made me something of an optimist is that the adoption of practices that uh, can help rebuild soil fertility uh, involve less plowing, less use of nitrogen fertilizer, 
and less reliance on monocultures, growing a greater diversity of crops. Um, and those first two, it, you know, if we can spend less on diesel, spend less on fertilizer, spend less on pesticide, it actually helps the bottom line for farmers. And so I've seen over the last 15 years or so, they've been thinking and writing on, on this subject, growing interest from the farming community at rethinking conventional agriculture, because farmers are caught in the middle between really high input prices, the high cost of diesel, high cost of fertilizer, high cost of patented seeds. And by growing a lot of very few crops, they're getting less for what they harvest. And that's a classic economic squeeze play. And a lot of farmers are looking for a different way out. And so if you can offer them techniques that reduce the reliance on nitrogen fertilizer, reduce their diesel bill, reduce the payments they're making to their agrochemical suppliers, they're starting to become more and more interested in listening to that. And I've seen a lot of progress in that area. And there's also the third leg of this is essentially consumer demand and interest. And that's where I think the, the relationship of farming practices to nutrient density really comes in. Because if you combine all those three, if there's economic incentives for farmers to transition, if there's governmental support for trying to you know, minimize the risk to farmers to doing that and encourage people to adopt more regenerative practices that are better for the society in the long run, and if consumers are starting to demand products that are grown that way, you line all those three up and it's a recipe for change. I agree with you. We have the opportunity to vote with our dollars. I think more and more consumers are. Uh, you know, I, I can't have a discussion around farmland without bringing up Bill Gates. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll just preface this with, I am not a conspiracy theorist. I do not believe he had anything to do with the pandemic or microchips in us or, or any of that. I think he is a very smart software entrepreneur. I think we've all established he was a terrible husband, kind of a little, a little, a little bit of a creepy guy. <laughs> uh, and I think he has zero awareness on health when I see his comments publicly around lab grown meat, see him, you know, drinking Coca-Cola all the time. The guy clearly is a weight problem and I, I get concerned when he is now the largest private owner of farmland in the country owning something like 269,000 acres I'm like this is the wrong guy stick to the excel spreadsheets the software windows still makes a lot of money all that other stuff I'm like do not stay in your lane you're <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, but, I, you know, and I see there's a lot of conspiracy theories around Bill Gates and farmland. Like, I don't think I, I don't buy that. I'm just concerned he's going to destroy it. I think he's, he's, he's clueless. I'll just pause there. Like, how concerned should we be about this guy owning as much farmland as he does? Yeah. And that all depends on what is he doing out there on the farmland? I, I, I this, likely is not happening jason but i'll just put the idea out there in case he's listening he's definitely not listening to this podcast <laughs> definitely not listening yeah i would i you know what would be really neat because we don't have this because there is not sufficient funding to to do these kinds of things but uh to be doing crop trials on uh, soil health and, you know, what kind of crops do best when we improve the health of the soil and to be doing traditional kinds of breeding to figure these kinds of things out. That's what ought to be happening, I think, on all of this farmland. Now, what likely is happening is either this is just some kind of an investment thing, a place to park some money, and all this land is being leased out to farmers. We don't we don't know. But um, I, I also would have concerns about, I guess, you know, you, whenever you stay sort of in your own sort of mindset, and your ideas, I mean, part of that is that everyone has a different background and we all tend to gravitate toward the things that we're, we're comfortable in. Um, and there's a place for some technology for sure in agriculture. I don't think it's the kind of technology that, you know, Gates personally, uh, the kind of technology that he's talking about isn't what I'm talking about when I think about technology and, and agriculture. So I don't, 
it, that's a little bit troubling. Maybe someone can look into this and report back about, you know, what is what is happening on all that farmland? Because I, there really is, there's a huge need out there to be doing more research on, um, I don't want to put a label on it because it gets, it gets murky between, you know, organic and regenerative and hydroponic. So I will just put it this way. There needs to be more research out there on how we make uh, farming practices um, return better soil health, better planetary health, and better human health. So that as a consequence of the way we farm, things are better off and not worse off. If Bill Gates can do that out on his 200 and some thousand acres of farmland, and he's figured that out and he's looking at that, I'm all ears. I want to hear about that. Yeah, the the da the danger with um, sort of blind techno optimism, which um, some folks are are prone to, uh, is that we may miss the opportunity that I think we really have here in agriculture, which isn't so much to blindly embrace new technologies as our as our, as our salvation. And it's not so much to go back to, you know, some, you know, mythologized old traditional practices of farming that you know, might not be able, capable of feeding the world. What I think we have an opportunity to do is to take a lot of the ancient wisdom of things like cover crops and crop rotations um, and combine that with modern technology that allows us to do things like no-till, uh, to wean ourselves off of agrochemicals and to, you know, do things like precision agriculture, to use a little bit of things here and there that we might want to use to actually couple modern technology to that ancient wisdom or use the ancient wisdom to guide the application of modern technology. We're really at a crossroads, I think, in agriculture and at the foundation for the two paths forward are how we think about the soil. And so if you think about investing in rebuilding soil health as a planetary infrastructure project that future generations of people need us to do on their behalf, that's a very positive vision for, for the way forward. If we're just thinking about, you know, continuing to do things the way we've been doing them and then rely on, on lab grown meat to make up for the damage, that's that's not really a very positive uh, uh, solution. And we've got this century to figure it out. We've got the next couple decades to pull off a transition. Um, and you know, I like to think that I'm an optimist by choice because I think it's an imperative that we need to, to transition to a more resilient and sustainable and regenerative style of agriculture. Yeah, I'm with you. And, and to me, it's so upsetting because Gates specifically, because every acre counts. So I'm like, oh, great. 270,000 to this guy. And I was hoping you guys are in Seattle. I thought you would you would have the, the inside scoop of what he's really doing with the farmland. No, but if, he, if you'd like to talk to us, we'd be happy to have a conversation about you know, uh, positive ways. Maybe he is a listener. Maybe we'll get him on. All kidding aside, you know, what, what I, I loved about the book, there's just so much great research. You guys put so much into it what was there one study that just really jumped out at you while you're writing the book where your jaw dropped and said wow i can't believe we're not talking about this well you know the one that really jumped out to me was the the study that ann found about tomatoes and flavor and the connection to bitter taste receptors because that was um an aha moment for me in thinking that oh wait our bodies are actually wired to interrogate the, the, the micronutrient and phytochemical content of what's coming into our bodies as a way to auto-regulate, you know, how health, you know, our diet. And we've, that's fairly new knowledge in terms of science, um, but it's pretty powerful in terms of thinking about the way our bodies have been shaped and the way our, the foundation for our health and the way that both modern agriculture and modern food processing have disrupted sort of our inherent internal biology. And, you know, to me, that was a real eye opener because that's not my area of expertise or specialty. But the lights went on with that study to go, oh, my, that's the last piece that we needed to think about this thread. Where in the book, we look at how farming practices affect the health of the soil. The health of the soil affects the health of crops. The health of crops affects the health of livestock and how all of the above translates into uh, human health. You can connect it all up with um, with pretty solid science. It's just there's a lot of variables in between. You know, we know our genes affect our health. We know what we eat affects our health. We know our lifestyle affects our health. But what we want to add to the list with this book is that what your food ate matters to your health as well. Yeah. And I, I think when you ask that that question, for me, the kinds of, of studies and research that um, really sort of made my heart sing were things that got at the bigger picture. A, a lot of these, a lot of the 
the research that we did dealt with, um, you know, these sort of reductionist science and specific mechanisms and specific nutrients and outcomes and effects and so on. And there's a fair bit of variability in those kinds of studies for a really good reason. People are hugely variable. Soils are hugely variable. So you put that all together and sometimes you're left with, you know, scratching your head. Other times it's, it's really clear. And so in a situation like that, I always like to sort of come up to the next level and ask um, sort of a really fundamental question, which is, well, are the processes in place for the health of the soil and for the health of the human body? Because all the mechanisms, if they're all working like they should be, I don't need to know each and every one. I need to know that they all adding up to this higher order process, whether that's a normal inflammatory process, whether that's normal phytochemical production, because when all those things are happening, the crop is what it should be, health is what it should be, the animal is what it should be. And I think the body, some of Fred Provenza's research that we relied on um, for the animal parts of the book and what Dave was just talking about, these linkages between um, flavor and health, uh, is really interesting because it tells us that there's this inherent wisdom in our bodies, the same way there is in a plant, the same way there is in a ruminant, to know what to eat. It's just that we've put so many things um, in the way of our body wisdom, or they pull our body wisdom down side alleys, where we really shouldn't be sitting there thinking, wow, this potato chip tastes so good. It's like, actually, that's hijacking your body wisdom. We're trying to use our body wisdom in ways that it already, you know, knows knows how to select foods that are good for us. So with some of these higher order things that really began to make a lot of um, sense for me in linking uh, how we treat the soil to what ends up rippling through uh, into our lives and our bodies. I'm curious, have you changed anything specifically in the, the way you eat since writing this book? I mean, the one the one really obvious change to me is that we've gone to you know 100% grass-fed meat and dairy when, when and where we can get it. Now, Ann and I are omnivores. We'll eat anything. Um, but we pay a lot more attention now to how it was raised, to what it ate. Um, yeah. And I always – and this, this sort of stems from our previous book, The Hidden Half of Nature – um, I always think about my microbiome and what does the microbiome want for dinner? Because we're sort of feeding, you know, there's a lot to our body and um, uh, fats is what our immune system is after. So I'm, I'm always thinking about healthy fats, but it's our microbes. It's our microbes down there in the gut that thrive on uh, fermenting the fiber in plant foods. And it turns out, you know, phytochemicals are embedded in that fiber. And so our microbiome is also turning phytochemicals into other things that benefit our health. So I'm, this is personally why I like omnivory. I'm looking to eat, you know, a wide diversity of things so I can support a wide diversity of farmers. I'm thinking a wide diversity of microbes in my body and that all of this, you know, eventually will um, sort of knit up to a, a different way of seeing food and farming and health. Amen. And, and in closing, is, is there one thing that people listening should focus on to really make a difference here? Boy, well, I think it's trying to spread the, the awareness that what's good for the land is good for us, too. Yeah. And I, I think, um, Jason, a lot of people, we're sort of still in some ways at a very basic level of awareness raising and education about why farming practices matter so much. And it's not solely about stuff like pesticides. It's because of everything else that we've been talking about. And as with any topic or issue, the more educated you get, the more um, information you can lay your hands on, then you start getting, you know, own ideas about what to do or who to talk to or, you know, things to do differently. So that's that's really our hope with this book is that we put it out there. It's fodder for the mind. It's fodder for the body. And can take that where they um, 
where they want to, which is, you know, I hope to, you know, a, a better place for our land and our health. David, Ann, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>